today I'll be talking about Jim and Wally, which was printed in 1916 in London, Toronto and Melbourne. Uh, and it is the second of the trilogy that deal with uh, World War One. Uh, and uh, most of it, is, it takes place in Ireland. So the scene opens, uh, they're on the front, uh, there's a gas attack and uh, they have to jump out of their trench and Jim and Wally pull some people out of the trench. They're gassed so they have to then go and recuperate and they all go on a holiday to Ireland. Uh, so they obviously go with Nora and Mr Linton as well. Uh, on the way over to Ireland, their ship is attacked by a German U-boat, German ship, uh, and they think it's going to sink, but it doesn't, and they have to comfort uh, an elderly Irish priest who mawkishly dies in their arms within sight of Ireland. Oh, it's so... it's so... twee. They get to Ireland and they have a lovely time uh, with all of the lackadaisical, sort of comically laid back uh, Irish people. They go trout fishing and bog leaping. Uh, they they don't talk politics. <laughs> um, uh, Nora uh, rescues a, a little boy from drowning and uh, Wally uh, encounters this, uh, this uh, man who's of depressed because he can't fight because of his physical condition so uh, they befriend him and then uh, luckily they encounter a German sub that is uh, like refueling in, on the Irish coastline and they capture it and their their new friend John O'Neill dies while they're doing that so that's a quick plot summary um, and as you can see there's a lot of rescues built in Jim and Wally rescue people from the trenches. Uh, Nora uh, pulls a, a kid out of a bog. Uh, Wally uh, befriends uh, John O'Neill, which is um, actually lovely because Wally himself is the, the one who is prone to depression. Uh, and then they all befriend him and then they capture a German sub because it's a bit like a boy's own adventure at the end there. Um, Bruce, uh, his own experiences informed this, this book because her husband was a major in the British Army and he was actually stationed in Ireland training troops uh, until the uh, uprising, which he helped put down. Uh, and then uh, the Irish troops were transferred to be trained in England rather than Ireland because the government thought that they might uh, they might join in the uprising, uh, and uh, her husband George Bruce was was outraged by this. So was was Mary Grant Bruce, because she had worked very hard uh, to get close to the soldiers. I guess she spent a lot of time, you know, writing letters for the illiterate, visiting their wives, visiting them when they're wounded, uh, you know, generally helping out. In addition to writing. You know, several novels in addition to uh, having two kids. So she was quite busy at this period in her life, I think you could say. Uh, this this book is set in Ireland during World War One, and Ireland was in a very unusual position during World War I. Um, Bruce says, uh, I believe it's peaceful there if you don't talk politics, and she herself uh, was stationed uh, because her husband was a major in the Royal Dublin Fusiliers. Uh, so she drew on that experience. Uh, and Ireland had a very odd World War I experience. All right. Unlike the rest of Great Britain, there was no conscription. However, there were masses of volunteers, both from the northern parts of what would later become you know, uh, Northern Ireland, um, the more Protestant areas. Uh, because they were supporting England and also from the south uh, the more Catholic areas which would quite soon after World War One become a separate country uh, because they saw the German threat to 
um, well, partly because they saw the German threat to Belgium as being an intrinsic, inherent threat to small countries like Ireland. Um, and at the same time, there were spirited attempts to break away from uh, English rule uh, with, uh, you know, the, the, the Dublin uprising of 1916. You know, it's the same old thing since 1916 with the guns and the bombs and the guns. All right, um, Bruce <laughs> tried to not comment on any of the pol uh, the political uh, stuff that was going down. Uh, she just says, you know, that the troops were very brave. They uh, enlisted even though they didn't need to, and they fought well. Uh, that's her position, uh, and um, she was outraged on behalf of the troops when they were moved when they they were moved to England because there was a fear that they would join uh, the rebels the quartet in a uh, mostly Catholic southern coastal area but she doesn't talk about politics at all except when they are capturing the sub they have a bit of a discussion about whether or not they can trust um, the, the postmaster to send the telegraph and uh, that's that the only indication that the people of Ireland are not fully behind uh, England. Now you remember in Mates at Billabong that uh, there were chapter headers uh, with little excerpts of poetry. Uh, she she uses the same technique in this novel. It's a two novels where she, two Billabong novels where she does that, and it's a complete contrast with her earlier choices of male Australian authors. Uh, she's choosing largely female authors with colonial and Irish connections. Um, real change of pace. Okay, so who are these these authors? There's Moira O'Neill. Uh, who wrote under the name Agnes Shakespeare Higginson, was a, an Irish-Canadian poet who wrote mostly ballads and verse inspired by Ireland. Um, so she's roughly her contemporary. He was born in, uh, born about 14 years before her, and she's an Irish writer who then lived in Canada. Uh, Dora Wilcox, who was a New Zealand and Australian poet and playwright, so, uh, born in 1873, so again roughly a contemporary and a colonial like Bruce. Uh, Marjorie Ruth Betts, who's an Australian poet who was active in World War I writing. Uh, details of her life are extremely sketchy. But I, I did discover that um, one of her poems was excerpted into a high school primer in 1918. Uh, so the Victorian Education Department school paper uh, included uh, this, this poem by her, which I will read to you. The Young Dead uh, by Marjorie Ruth Betts. We have a pledge with you we may not break, the fear and pain you knew, the blood you shed. Your shattered bodies, cold and still and dead, are as silent awful vow we make, in honour's name, for honour's shining sake. For us, your yielded youth is gathered up, like to the wine in God's uplifted cup, which kneeling at his altar steps we take. So we shall never suffer wills grown cold, nor hold that falsehood differs not from truth, nor tame our hard desires to lesser aims, but dare the years with youth's imperious claims, since we shall have, yes, even being old, still beating at our hearts, your unused youth. Um, I wish I could find more about her, um, because I, I, and, and I wish that this was still quoted at Anzac Day ceremonies rather than the usual collection of World War One poets. All right. Uh, also. Uh, she had chapter headers from uh, R.L. Stevenson, who obviously um, is still widely read, mostly for his novels, not his poetry. Uh, Victor James William Patrick Daly, who was an Australian poet, uh, part of the Irish literary revival or Celtic Twilight in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. Um, John Dryden, who's a, a poet still read today, the first poet laureate. Ethna Carberry, who was an Irish journalist, writer and poet. Uh, so in Belfast in the late 1890s, she produced a nationalist monthly of literature, history and comment that had uh, a wide circulation. So again, strong Irish connection, a woman and a contemporary of Bruce's, effectively. Uh, and then we've got quotes from Eva Gore Booth, who was an Irish poet and dramatist, committed suffragette, social worker and labour activist. Uh, Henry... Uh, Henry John Newbolt, who was an English poet, 
Um, he was also a historian and a government advisor on do, 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 Irish affairs. Uh, and then there's a guy called Dudley Clark that I can find nothing about. I did find a Dudley Clark who was a cross-dressing master of military deception during World War II, but I'm, I'm going to assume that's not the same guy. I don't know, but I could not find anything about uh, Dudley Clark. If anyone can let me know, I'd, I'd love to. And maybe it is the same guy. Maybe Dudley Clark was a cross-dressing master of military deception and disguise. All right, then she quotes uh, what she calls a student song about the walloping window blind, but uh, uh, Google says that this was originally a poem by uh, Charles Edward Carroll, who was an American stockbroker and comic poet, um, but she doesn't seem to have known the origins of the song. All right, so in summary, we've got a lot of Irish writers, colonial writers, women who are her contemporaries. So this is not a uh, conservative list uh, like the uh, the one in the um, this is not a conservative list like in the the previous novel of you know Australian I'm going to say dead white men it's uh, it's up to date women writing I guess from the margins um, and that is a very interesting choice. I feel that there's actually a difficulty in the tone in this book because um, Bruce uh, obviously was writing about war that was going on. It was unclear at this point who was going to win. Um, she, but she very definitely wanted to write for children. Um, so she was trying to, to walk a line. Uh, the beginning of Jim and Wally is actually one of the first descriptions of a gas attack on Australian soldiers by any author. Um, uh, but also uh, a lot of the activities that they have have a bit of a boy's own adventure feel to them. So, for instance, when they capture the German sub, uh, John O'Neill dies and uh, he says, it was great luck. God had pity, enormous luck to finish at a man's job. He did not speak again. The sun, climbing upward, shone tenderly upon the happy face. I feel like that could be pretty much any henty death of a, you know, colonial warrior. It's a, uh, it's pretty, it's pretty sanitized stuff for a death during World War One. You note that Bruce had decided that she was going to keep the quartet together by moving them to the UK. Uh, and she manages it in this book by having the boys wounded and uh, spending uh, the entire book on their leave while they're recuperating. So she keeps them all together from almost all of the book. Uh, you could compare this to, say, Ethel Turner, who wrote a trilogy of books, uh, the Captain Cub books, uh, at almost exactly the same time, uh, and her emphasis is quite different. She uh, was consciously writing for, a, I guess, a flapper audience, uh, and the focus was on uh, the romance between Bridget and Cub, uh, but they're separated by the war. Uh, so Turner said, um, she said that the Cub was a book for the young woman of today, young girl of today, who with the world turned upside down and partings always in the air really demands her love story. Uh, and Bruce very definitely did not want to have write a love story uh, until she was finally pushed into it in the 20s uh, and kept the focus firmly on children's adventure and Wally is not allowed to develop his, emo his, his feelings for Nora beyond a certain line with our note that he is the one who's a bit concerned that she gets involved in capturing the German sub. The others are all like, yeah, that's fine. And he's like, oh, but you know, what if she gets hurt? Because, uh, you know, he cares too much. Also, uh, Bruce didn't know when she decided to send the Lintons to, to Britain, but it meant that they did not get involved at all in the Anzac, um, and the Anzac campaign, which was um, the iconic Australian experience of World War I. Uh, instead, they're on the Western Front. So Bruce had decided in 1915 to have the Lintons move to Britain so she could keep them together and so she could draw on her own experiences. And this meant she didn't 
get to have the boys at what turned out to be the iconic moment in Australian history, Gallipoli. Uh, and here's, here's an excerpt from what Jim, was, Jim thought about Gallipoli. Down in his quiet soul, he was torn between utter pride in his countrymen and woe that he had not been able to be with them in that stern Gallipoli landing, the latter emotion firmly repressed. It had been the fight of his boyish dreams, wild charging, hand-to-hand work, a fleeing enemy, not like this hole-and-corner trench existence, unseen by the unseen foe, with death that could not be combated dropping from the sky. His old schoolfellows had been at Gallipoli and had made good. He ached to have been with them. I, um, I... I'm not a huge fan of the straight adventure stories, but I did learn a lot when I was thinking about this pod, oh, this this review. I had not really known anything about World War One in Ireland, uh, and I've learnt learnt quite a bit. Um, and Bruce, of course, lived in Ireland after World War One, uh, and she has uh, quite a few Irish immigrants in her later novels who are mostly leaving because of I'm about to call them troubles but they weren't the troubles that's that's the more recent one because of the civil war I guess in the 1920s um so it's a it's a continuing theme and she loved Ireland and was actually quite sad when uh, they had to leave it I do really enjoy uh the way Bruce is consciously positioning her novels in a stream of of literature and she's referring to all of these contemporary uh, authors who are themselves colonial because you know the Irish and the Australians it's kind of like their first and their 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 youngest colony and their oldest um as I said uh, in the previous previous episode when I was talking about from Billabong to London, from Billabong to London, not Jim and Wally. Um, Marsden uh, is strongly influenced by Bruce, and I'm I'm actually quite enjoying looking at Bruce linking back to other authors, but also moving forward, being referenced by by. Um, by more contemporary authors, uh, it's quite an interesting experience to see her um, in this this stream of, of allusions between one. Uh, I guess it's like a conversation from one author to the next. So, uh, I'd recommend it as a, a rattling good yarn. Um.